Thank you, Kim. I'm deeply honored to have had work in the first two issues of Mexo Camine and to have been associated with the Timeline Project. Um, I still have my Norton anthologies from my college undergraduate days, <laughs> English lit, modern poetry, contemporary poetry, and there aren't many women in there, and it hasn't been all that long, so <laughs> there's still, there is still a way to go. I agree. Um, now that I'm supposed to be representing Louisiana in poetry for the next couple of years, I'm feeling perversely drawn to poems about my Boston Irish Catholic origins. <laughs> So that's what I'm going to read this morning. Um, I was asked to contribute to a special uh, feature in Drunken Boat magazine on the centennial of Eugene O'Neill, and we were asked to write something about how his work had influenced ours. And I thought about the first time when I read Long Day's Journey into Night in high school and recognized my own family dynamics in there. So this is a four villanelle sequence in four acts, and each one is about a marriage in my family, my two grandparents' marriages, my parents' marriages, and then the uh, married couple in Long Day's Journey into Night. Family Dramas, Act One, The Glen Canes. Whatever time the boys got home for dinner, dinner would be ready because something gray was always bobbing in a long, slow simmer on the gas stove. Next to the electric ringer, my aunt had won for once on opening day of the A&P that sold the meat for dinner. Boiled past telling, was it beef or liver? Now and then some washed up horse or greyhound won against long odds, and then the simmer of her long, slow anger wouldn't breach the inner surface of the cook pot of her rage, though she'd slam down plates as she dished out dinner. Grandma eating in her room, having lingered decades in her sick bed since her husband went away, and her heart boiled over from its long, slow simmer. Most nights, they'd slink home losers or sinners, like steak knives and teeth tearing into that gray, sodden mass that was being served up for dinner. Words tried their edges on what had long simmered. And this is Act Two, The Lynch Spillanes. Mary on the wall in my grandmother's room with a holy palm frond stuck behind the frame looked like a hussy with an ostrich plume in her hat by the dresser with my sin perfume and a silver-backed brush. But the walls were quite plain across the hallway in my grandfather's room. And even a child could safely assume that the bedrooms and silences meant that some shame still lurked like a hussy in an ostrich plume. <laughs> Grandma made Mary Jane cocktails, one teaspoon of cherry juice making the ginger ale stain, while Grandpa just yelled at us, go to your room, when we stepped in his garden or banged out of tune on his precious piano. Our room was the same that our mother had slept in. It's Mary, too, plumed. Past 40, I learned what they took to their tombs. Once sent home from school with stomach pains, my mother found them in the living room, her mother and the priest, like a bride and groom. <laughs> Act three, the splain canes. We three little girls would be sent outside. She liked to call the street a cul-de-sac. Whenever the two of them had to fight, Although we were in our rooms the night she shattered glass after glass after glass on the bricks around the fireside, clutching our teddy bears, terrified, and even then their words were held back. Whenever the two of them had to fight, we'd take our bikes for a good long ride or play with our trolls or mouse the cat, and it could get dark and cold outside. We too had truths we had to hide. The times he begged for a loan of cash from our china pigs, we knew they'd fight if we told. The times she cried and cried and dinner was milk and sugar smacks. Although we were always sent outside, their words still burn like dead stars light. Act four, the cabin tyrants. I read that play in high school. Mrs. T took morphine, but I knew the family well the language of their fights like poetry, the silences like wind through stunted trees, 
the drunken charmers and the ne'er-do-wells who couldn't charm the bitter Mrs. T, the backdrop of a gray Atlantic sea, as cold in August as a heart withheld, its rhythms those of Irish poetry. O'Neill's own family drama spoke to me, the ponies running like a carousel whose painted glitter holds out mystery, but finish line becomes infinity. How habits shape of lives a villanelle, the repetitions turn to poetry. I pray to the quatrain to set me free. We Irish know that language is a spell. I read that play in high school, Mrs. T, my fate without the grace of poetry. My ex-husband and I watched Red Sox games all the time on our little 12-inch diagonal TV the first year we were married. And when they made it, uh, when they clinched the American League pen in 2004, after that I wrote this. This is particle physics. They say two photons fired through a slit stay paired together to the end of time. If one is polarized to change its spin, the other does a U-turn on a dime. Although they fly apart at speeds of light and never cross each other's paths again, like us, a couple in the 70s, divorced for almost 30 years since then. Tonight, a Red Sox batter homered twice to beat the Yankees in their playoff match. And sure as I was born in Boston, when that second ball deflected off the bat, I knew your thoughts were flying back to me though your location was a mystery. And I'll end with one more poem about um, the legacy of uh, being Irish, one of them being red hair. This is men who love redheads. <laughs> you can pick one out in a crowd by the way he jerks his head when an Irish setter passes. <laughs> Drawn to that shade of red. <laughs> He'll utter even to Raggedy Ann. <laughs> if all your freckles merge, do you know you have a tan? <laughs> there are times you miss the clues till you wake up after sex to behold the nightstand photo of his red haired kids and ex. <laughs> then you know for all of your charms he was only caught in the pull of that least known force of physics as a red flag draws a bull. <laughs> Some obsessives like girls plump or missing a limb or two, but the men hung up on redheads are the men who prey on you. Compared to men as a whole, their numbers are very small, yet without their kind in the world, you might never get laid at all. <laughs>